The Clinton Correctional Facility Incident, New York 2015. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. When we talk about prison escapes, we often think of two famous cinematic and television works, The Shawshank Redemption, and the popular 2005 TV series, Prison Break, starring Wentworth Miller. These iconic pieces of entertainment have left a deep impression on us, and the inspiration for most of these films and television shows originates from reality. In fact, there have been several successful real-life prison breaks, such as the Alcatraz escape in the 1960s, where some prisoners managed to flee from an island prison surrounded by water. However, most cases of successful prison escapes portrayed in movies are often based on outdated tools or technologies from earlier eras. Nowadays, most prisons are equipped with advanced security measures that make it extremely difficult for inmates to break free. However, the case I want to tell you about today didn't just happen at a modern, well-fortified prison. It occurred at a facility where no escape had ever taken place since its establishment 180 years ago. This is the story of the Clinton Correctional Facility escape in 2015, which happened just about eight years ago. Clinton Correctional Facility is located in Danamora, New York, USA, and it was constructed in 1844. The facility is situated near a mountain called Lyon. The initial purpose of building this prison was to allow inmates to work in the mines and labor more easily on the mountain. By 1877, due to the continuous increase in the inmate population, the prison had become overcrowded, making it virtually unable to accommodate everyone. Therefore, they decided to expand and renovate the prison. They constructed additional cell blocks and new facilities. The prison's perimeter wall was raised to the height equivalent to a four to five story building as they improved the prison's technical specifications. As a result, it became a facility for housing dangerous criminals, equipped with a world-class security management and equipment. It had a total of nearly 1,000 rotating guards on duty and held nearly 3,000 inmates. It was known as the largest and most secure prison in the state of New York, with almost no chance of escape. However, in 2015, two inmates successfully escaped from the Clinton Correctional Facility. So, what happened on that day? How did these two prisoners manage to break free? Next, we will rewind back to June 6, 2015, to find out. At 5.30 a.m. on June 6, 2015, the headcount at the Clinton Correctional Facility began, following the usual morning routine. Within the prison, the cell blocks were divided into various sections. Besides the standard cell blocks, there was a special area known as the Honor Block. The Honor Block cells were different from the regular ones. They were relatively larger, designed for single occupancy, and inmates in this area had the privilege of designating daily times for watching TV and making phone calls. The facilities in the Honor Block were among the best in the entire prison. The majority of inmates in Clinton Correctional Facility were serious offenders, often serving life sentences. The honor block was a place every prisoner aspired to be, but only those who showed good behavior and demonstrated a commitment to rehabilitation were eligible to live there. On the fourth floor of the honor block, there were two adjacent cells, cell 23 and cell 24. One of these cells belonged to Richard Matt, born in 1966, who was imprisoned for the kidnapping and murder of his former 72-year-old boss in 1998. The other cell was occupied by David Sweat, born in 1980, who was sentenced for the murder of a police officer in 2002. In the early morning, after completing the routine headcount in the regular cell blocks, the guards moved on to conduct the headcount in the honor block cells. When they reached cell 23 and cell 24, they called out the names of Matt and Sweat for the headcount but received no response. Looking inside, they saw the two inmates still in their beds, apparently asleep. Frustrated, the guard banged on the bars of the cell to wake them up. After urging them two or three times, the figures in the beds remained still and unresponsive. The guard then used a pocket flashlight to peer into the cell and realized something was amiss. He opened the cell door to investigate further, only to discover that the two prisoners had vanished. The guard quickly reported the situation to the central command. An alarm was immediately raised, and all cell blocks were locked down tightly. All available law enforcement officers were deployed to thoroughly search every nook and cranny of the prison. After an extensive search yielded no results, the guard reported the escape to the governor of New York. 
Ultimately, over 450 police officers and several helicopters were dispatched to assist in the search. Roadblocks were swiftly set up on major routes, and all vehicles passing through were rigorously inspected. A house-to-house -house search was conducted in the town. The escapees were considered dangerous criminals, so the manhunt was intensified. This not only made it more challenging for the two inmates to remain at large but also heightened anxiety among the local residents. So, how did they escape? After the investigation, the detectives found a neatly cut rectangular hole under the beds in cells 23 and 24 in the honor block, where the two inmates were held. The location was originally an air vent with a metal grate. The hole was just large enough for one person to squeeze through. Behind the hole was a narrow passage filled with various pipes. Their cells were on the fourth floor. After exiting through the vent hole, they descended to the first basement level through a gap in the passage. Here, they carved an opening in a steam pipe with a 60 centimeters diameter, big enough for a person to crawl through. Before they left, they even left a taunting note behind with a drawn smiley face and a message wishing everyone a good day. After entering the underground pipe, they crawled for hundreds of meters to reach the underground sewage system. Through the sewage system, they continued to climb up a staircase, opened a manhole, and successfully escaped. The location where they emerged from the prison walls was approximately 120 meters from the prison building. Not far from the sewage system exit were two guard towers, Tower 1 and Tower 2. According to the statements of the guards, a routine nighttime headcount was conducted at 10.30 p.m. on June 5. The night before the escape, they were certain that both Matt and Sweat were in their cells. Therefore, the time frame for their escape would have been between 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. the following day. Due to the limited visibility outside the prison at night and the fact that no escapes had ever occurred within the prison before, the guards on the two towers had let their guard down and did not see the two inmates emerging from the sewer. During the investigation, detectives suspected that the two prisoners could not have escaped from such a high security prison on their own someone must have aided them. They examined Matt and Sweat's contact records with the outside world to find leads, but nothing suspicious was found. Then they ruled out the possibility of outside help and primarily shifted their investigation internally within the prison. An investigation involving inmates was initiated. Among the list of suspects was an employee named Joyce Mitchell, who was 51 years old. Every day, she would arrange various sewing jobs for prisoners and teach them sewing-related skills. Some inmates hinted to investigators that Sweat had an inexplicable relationship with Mitchell. Mitchell often called Sweat to her office for various reasons. This didn't happen just once or twice, making their relationship quite ambiguous. Mitchell, being 51 years old and no longer youthful, made it an intriguing topic of conversation among the inmates after mealtime. Moreover, several prisoners noticed Matt visiting Mitchell's office alone on multiple occasions. Upon discovering these clues, investigators believed that this situation was not a coincidence. Consequently, they immediately summoned Mitchell, and she confessed to everything. It turned out that Mitchell and her husband were both employees of Clinton Correctional Facility. Time had strained their marriage, creating an opportunity for outsiders to exploit. All the inmates at Clinton Correctional Facility were male, and Mitchell worked as a sewing instructor there. As a result, Sweat and Matt grew attached to her, showing care and concern. Gradually, Mitchell developed feelings for them, something she hadn't experienced in a long time. Matt and Sweat saw this and continued to lure her with both emotional and physical affection, ultimately winning her over. They passionately challenged her relationship with her husband, highlighting how unhappy and dull her marriage was. If Mitchell helped the two of them escape from the prison, they promised to put her at the top of their priorities and take her to Mexico, offering her a new, happy life. At 51 years old, Mitchell was deeply moved by this offer. So, she willingly provided them with hacksaw blades, chisels, a screwdriver, and other tools hidden in her frozen food bag at the correctional facility. Every day, she would smuggle these tools hidden inside frozen food bags into the prison. Matt and Sweat would then retrieve these bags and use the tools to prepare their escape. Additionally, Mitchell provided them with valuable information, such as the guard patrol schedules and a map of the prison's pipe distribution system. As the investigation progressed, the investigators discovered that, in addition to Mitchell, there were others within the prison who had helped them. 
Matt had a strong passion for painting and was a renowned artist. He was assigned to the prison's honor block due to his good behavior, and there was a dedicated studio there for him to paint. Matt excelled in various tasks, with a particular fondness for creating portraits of famous people. Then, a fellow inmate named Palmer couldn't resist the pressure and confessed to the investigators that he admired Matt's artwork so much that he had smuggled in some screwdrivers, pliers, and other tools in exchange for Matt's paintings. Palmer believed that Matt would use these tools only to frame his artwork and didn't realize they were intended for an escape plan. It was precisely because of these tools that Matt and Sweat managed to gradually open an escape route. Matt and Sweat spent over half a year preparing for their escape. They used a hacksaw to cut through the steel plate under their beds, which covered a ventilation duct. Every night around 10.30 p.m., there was a bed check, and every two hours, the guards would make their rounds. To avoid detection, they would stuff clothing and pillows under the blankets to make it appear as if someone was sleeping. The dim lighting and low visibility at night allowed them to employ this simple deception to fool the guards. After repeatedly fooling the patrolling guards, they quickly figured out a way to escape through the steam pipe tunnel and spent months slowly cutting a hole using a small hacksaw. During the winter, the steam pipes were filled with hot water due to the heating system being operational. Thus, they chose to escape in the summer, specifically in June, when the pipes were not active. They climbed hundreds of meters along the steam pipes and descended to the ground through a maintenance pipe. According to their initial plan, Mitchell was supposed to pick them up at a pre-arranged location with her car. Additionally, they had given her two pills to secretly administer to her husband, making it easier for them to eliminate him. However, on the fateful night, due to her years of emotional attachment to her husband, Mitchell couldn't go through with it. This caused her severe anxiety, leading to an anxiety attack from the overwhelming stress. As a result, her husband took her to the hospital, disrupting the escape plan. When they emerged from the tunnel that night, they found no getaway vehicle waiting for them. They had no choice but to travel on foot, as Mitchell had broken her commitment. According to Mitchell's account, they only had a plan A and no plan B without her assistance, the escape would become exceedingly difficult for both of them. Indeed, the Clinton Correctional Facility's limitations in external surveillance equipment proved to be a significant factor in the escape going undetected initially. While the prison had modern monitoring systems for its interior, the escapees were able to select an exit route that evaded this surveillance. Their original plan to reach Mexico from the northern United States, where they emerged from the tunnels, was challenging, especially without access to Mitchell's car. It's also possible that they modified their initial plan or improvised a new one due to the unforeseen circumstances. The lack of knowledge regarding their direction and movements made it difficult for law enforcement to establish any specific response or investigation on the first day following the escape. This allowed Matt and Sweat to gain some distance and remain undetected, at least during the initial stages of their escape. By the second day, the governor of New York at the time, Andrew Cuomo, announced a reward of $100,000 for anyone providing useful leads. Law enforcement recognized that as time passed, the pursuit became more challenging. As a result, they continuously bolstered their forces, including search and rescue teams, and set up roadblocks throughout the area. This made it so that the two escapees dared not venture onto major roads or interact with anyone. After the news spread, Residents in the town and surrounding areas heightened their vigilance, with police patrols in full force. If the fugitives attempted to seek food in the vicinity, it could lead to unfavorable consequences. Therefore, their only option was to retreat into the woods for survival. On June 22, the police received a call from a man named John Chodat. He often went hunting with his dog deep in the woods and had a cabin there for convenience. When he neared his cabin, he noticed a man hastily running away from the area. Upon entering the cabin, he found that everything inside had been disturbed. Food and alcohol had been nearly consumed. The police quickly responded to the scene, collecting samples of food and various items for DNA testing. The results revealed that the DNA matched that of Matt and Sweat. During the call, John mentioned that he had seen a man fleeing which suggested that the two escapees had likely split up and headed in different directions. Immediately, the police divided their search efforts into various areas and directions around the location. 
Four days later, the police found Matt running in the woods approximately 60 kilometers from the border and fatally shot him. He had many insect bites, was swollen, and had scratches on his body, suggesting he had endured a great deal during the 20 days he was on the run. Two days later, Sweat was also shot and wounded by patrolling police when he was just a few kilometers from the border. In his backpack, they found some tools, insect repellent, a map, and light food. The media then reported the capture of the fugitives, and people celebrated, no longer living in fear. In February 2016, Sweat was sentenced to seven years in prison, in addition to a previous life sentence, and was fined $80,000 USD. The seamstress, Mitchell, was sentenced to seven years in prison and fined $6,000 USD. Prison employee Palmer was sentenced to six months in prison and fined $5,000 USD. As of now, the Clinton Correctional Facility case has concluded. Thank you for listening, goodbye, and see you again.